Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, so this is the 23rd meeting uh, in the 2018 Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. And thank you for everyone uh, in attendance. Um, can we start, please, just noting agenda item one, um, our first agenda item for the committee to agree to take item four in private. And this item relates to a paper on parliamentary privilege. Uh, do members agree to take this item in private? Agreed. Agreed. So thank you very much. So agenda item four will be taken in private, which means that we now move to agenda item two. And it's an evidence session with the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland uh, on the annual report in 2017-2018 and on a review of operation of the 2013 Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments to Public Bodies in Scotland. And joining us today are uh, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, Bill Thompson. Thank you and welcome, Mr Thompson. And Ian Bruce, Public Appointments Manager, Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life. Welcome, Mr Bruce. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to invite the Commissioner to make a short statement, if, uh, if that's suitable, please. Thanks, Convener, and thank you for the invitation to attend this session. Um, I anticipate this being my last annual report evidence session with the committee in my capacity as Commissioner. Uh, the process for the appointment of my successor is underway, uh, and I hope to be able to organise a handover prior to demitting office at the end of March uh, 2019. For the benefit of those who may be less familiar, my role combines two former roles, those of the Commissioner for Public Appointments uh, and the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. And I suspect you'll be more familiar with the ethical standards role in pursuit of which I report to you on complaints about the conduct of MSPs Another aspect of that role, and one which actually demands much more of my time, involves the investigation of complaints about breaches of the Councillor's Code of Conduct and complaints about the conduct of people appointed to public boards. If, after investigation, I conclude that there's been a breach of the relevant code, I submit a report to the Standards Commission for Scotland. Complaints generally come to my office from members of the public who have concerns about the conduct of individuals in public life. Around 80% of the total number of councillor and public body complaints are initiated by members of the public. Another 18%, roughly, are submitted by councillors and the remaining few by MSPs, by MPs um, or by council officials. Initial investigations are conducted by experienced investigating officers. Uh, there are five of them, all of whom are appointed on a part-time basis. There's also a senior investigating officer who assists um, with difficult issues, monitors progress and is the first reviewer of draft reports. When a code breach is reported to the Standards Commission, they generally arrange to hold a public hearing at which evidence will be led in support of my conclusion that there's been a breach, followed by any contrary evidence on behalf of the councillor or the board member. Responsibility for presenting the evidence at the hearing and making submissions uh, is shared between me uh, and the senior investigating officer. I'm not normally involved in the initial investigation of complaints unless it relates to the conduct of an MSP. But all of the reports which are issued by the office are mine, uh, and most of them will have been through several iterations between the first draft and the final version which is issued. Um, I want to turn now to the work on public appointments, which is really of quite a different nature, even though it does involve a regulatory element uh, and very occasionally consideration of complaints submitted by applicants. In this capacity, um, I have a dual role, ensuring that public appointments are made openly and fairly with due regard to equality of opportunity and also promoting compliance with the statutory code of practice. The regulatory role applies to appointments made by ministers to the board of any of the regulated public bodies which are listed in statute. 
There are currently 96 such bodies. They include health boards, national park authorities, enterprise environment agencies and many others. Appointment decisions, as you'll be well aware, are made by ministers, but the job of attracting and assessing candidates is delegated to an appointment panel. Vacancies are advertised and candidates are assessed on the basis of criteria which are determined at the outset by ministers. Appointment panels are generally chaired by senior civil servants from the sponsor directorate, the minister's directorate, if you like. They often include the chair of the body whose board has a vacancy and they may also have an independent panel member who is familiar with the field in which the board operates. In addition, the panel may include a public appointments advisor drawn from a team of experts who are contracted to my office to provide both a supportive and a regulatory role. And the extent of the advisor's appointment, uh, sorry, involvement varies according to the nature of the position being filled. For example, if it's a round to find a new chair for a national body, the advisor will be involved throughout the appointment round up to the stage at which the panel's submission to the minister has been agreed. In some cases, however, the advisor is only involved in the planning stage uh, and in others there is no direct oversight. Uh, that is because we want the regulation to be proportionate. Ministers and appointment panels are expected to observe a code of practice for public appointments. The code was drawn up by my office um, and following a public consultation, it was agreed with ministers and with the parliament. It was last revised fully in 2013 by my immediate predecessor. The Code is a permissive document, despite what you may sometimes hear. Uh, it allows considerable freedom to those who are charged with making public appointments, so long as they respect the three principles. Those are merit, integrity, and the third is diversity and equality. Appointments must be made on merit. Merit is defined for each post by the Minister when setting or agreeing the criteria at the start of the process. The panel reports to the Minister on the relative merits of the candidates by assessing how well they meet the published criteria. As I've indicated, the Code is a permissive document. It does not require appointment rounds to be conducted in a particular way. On the contrary, we are keen to encourage and support improvements to processes and new approaches to attracting a more diverse field of applicants. The public appointments advisors, to whom I've already referred, and the small team in my office, which in fact is Ian plus one other part-time, um, they have considerable expertise which is available to support and improve the appointment process as well as to monitor compliance with the Code of Practice. We also conduct thematic reviews periodically to assess the extent to which the Code is being complied with, including in cases in which my office has had no direct involvement. We have been working together with Scottish Government officials on groundbreaking research to gather evidence on the impact of diversity on the governance of public boards in Scotland. That has not been done elsewhere. We also have been working on induction sessions for newly appointed board members um, and with officials and experienced board chairs uh, on a mentoring scheme for board members uh, who may wish to consider applying for a chair role in the future. Uh, that's all I wish to say by way of introductory statement. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, so, what we'd like to do, if it's all right with yourselves, is um, to ask a few questions, none of which shall be too onerous, I believe, but you never know. Uh, so, um, OK, uh, can we please just uh, go through things in a, a reasonable order? Um, and talk about complaints, first of all, against MSPs, as you, as you had previously mentioned yourself. Um, there were 28 complaints of possible breaches of the code. Um, only two of them were within your remit, apparently. Um, so of the 26 inadmissible complaints, um, to give guidance in terms of what really uh, the Commissioner's role actually is, um, you referred to 11 to other bodies and 15 were not referred onwards. Um, could you explain how the inadmissible complaints are handled and, and why they're particularly inadmissible in the first place, if that's possible? Yeah, convener. Um, I think you'll be aware the code 
Uh, section 9 of the Code sets out a number of complaints or types of complaint which are excluded from my jurisdiction. For example, complaints about the conduct of a member in a committee meeting um, are dealt with by the convener. Uh, complaints about the member's conduct or a member's conduct in the chamber are dealt with by the presiding officer. And there are other examples which I won't go through. Um, but I did, um, although I've lost it, um, make a note of the um, 16 cases um, that weren't even referred to anybody else. Um, there were five um, which involve conduct that simply isn't covered by the code. Um, and to give you examples, uh, comments made on TV uh, in the course of an interview, um, there was a complaint, uh, first of all, about the conduct of two members uh, in the chamber, uh, which I referred to the presiding officer, and about the presiding officer's apparent failure to reprimand them for that conduct. That's not covered by the code at all. Um, there were complaints about statements made or actions taken during the UK election campaign. These are not covered by the code. Um, there was another complaint that a particular party leader had not taken action um, in relation to the conduct of two of the members of that party which had offended the complainer. Um, there have been others in which there was simply no factual basis for the allegation. Um, and these tend to relate to alleged failure to declare, or in some cases, register an interest. And what happens is I write to the member who's allegedly failed to do so, and if they uh, are able to establish that um, either they don't have the interest or it's been registered or declared, then there's no basis for an investigation. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's quite clear. Um, I believe uh, Tom Mason would like to... Oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Yes, Elaine first. <laughs> Thanks, Convener. Just a, a small follow-up on that, if you don't mind. Um, good morning, Commissioner. Thanks for coming today. Do you think, then, that perhaps um, the, the information that that's available to the public and others about what your role is, isn't robust enough if you're receiving complaints that don't fall within the code, or alternatively, does the code need to be widened? Uh, um, uh, the last option uh, is one for you rather than for me. Um, I think it is quite difficult for people um, who are not immersed in it um, to be aware of what the code does and does not cover. Um, and it's particularly difficult to realise that some of the complaints that come to me should have been made to the corporate body or the presiding officer or the first minister. Um, we endeavour to make it plain on our website um, and in uh, documentary material that's available, but I don't think it's realistic to expect people to absorb all of that. Uh, and if I may just say, one of the things we've been doing um, is... Um, updating our website uh, and it's due to launch either later this month or early in the new year and that will include for the first time an online complaints process um, which will take people through step by step um, and there will be various pointers in the course of that which will discourage people from proceeding if they're raising something that, that I won't be able to or my successor won't be able to take on board as a complaint so I hope that will help but I think it's very difficult to explain the ins and outs of this in a clear way to the general public. I think, convener, maybe that will help, actually. It would yeah. be a, a step forward. And we'll see in future years what happens to the numbers. Well, I, yes, I think that's a very useful question. And so was, I think, the pointer towards um, the uh, online uh, it's a procedure, which I think will actually help a lot of people then, actually. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, is it something directly related first? Yeah, Gil, yeah on yeah. your place. Yeah, in that regard, do you, if, for instance, there was a complaint in, uh, that should be appropriate for a party uh, uh, leader, would you signpost that or would you just not take it any further? I'm required by statute to notify any member against whom a, a complaint is received. So if I did receive a complaint about a party leader's actions or failure to take action, um, they would be notified of that. 
um, but also in responding to the complaint, if it's outside my jurisdiction, I do my best to explain why, and if there is an alternative, what the alternative might be. Mm, that's good. And in the forum that you have uh, for, uh, to put online, will, will there be a, a reference in there that for that uh, facility? Yes, um, we have to strike a balance between complicating the thing dreadfully um, and leading, allowing people to get through it without uh, losing their rag because of the, <laughs> the nature of the process. Um, but the short answer is yes, I can't remember the detail of what it will say. Yeah. Good, thanks for that. Thanks, Arthur. The idea, I suppose, is to simplify and make it easier for people to understand anyway. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Mason, please. Thank you. Good, good morning, gentlemen. Um, Targets. You've been quite successful in achieving most of the targets except the initial assessment. Yes. Um, can you any good reasons why that hasn't been achieved? And is 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 the, is the target itself realistic? Um, or are, are, in fact, are all the targets realistic? Um, th th thanks for that question. They, I think table fourteen specifically. Yep. Yeah, um, the, the annual report may be slightly misleading in this respect. Um, table 14 relates to the initial assessment of complaints, specifically those about councillors and members of public bodies. Um, we have set a 100% target for the initial assessment because that's what I'd like to achieve. Um, it's probably impossible to achieve, but I think a stretch target's a good idea in the sense of trying to get as close to it as possible. And one of the reasons why we don't always achieve it is because in order to make the initial assessment we need to obtain information from other people. It may be the person who's made the complaint, it may be the person about whom the complaint's been made, or it may be the council or the public body um, which that person is on. Um, and we simply don't always receive replies quickly and very occasionally we get a reply which requires a follow-up um, question. So some of them just don't make the 15 days, but um, we don't have a big problem in terms of delay. Um, and actually, with MSP complaints, uh, the stage one process, which is the equivalent, um, these have all been done within the rather more extended time limit. Thank you. Thank you yep. Yep. And uh, Jamie, do you want to just follow up on that? Yeah, follow up on, on, on the previous one. Um, good morning to you both. And uh, in, the, uh, in the information that you provided, certainly for the councillors, you provided an origin of complaints, but for the MSP um, complaints, I can't, couldn't see anything in there that uh, identified where those complaints, a breakdown of where those complaints had come from. Is that information that you hold, and if, if so, why wasn't that included? Um, I, I think the simple answer is I'm not required to produce it, but I do have the information, and I can let you have it. Yeah. Um, there are... probably two or three complaints every year made by one MSP about another MSP. Um, and regrettably, these have tended to include complaints which the person complaining has leaked or gone to the press about. Um, and that, of course, is a breach of the code in itself. Sometimes it results in a sort of tit-for-tat complaint um, in which the person who started it off ends up being the only one who breaches the code, somewhat ironically. Um, most of the others come from the public. Um, some of the public are politically active. Um, some of them may have held elected office in the past. Um, but motivation isn't an issue as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate it. It was really just, a, a, I suppose, um, I wondered whether there were perhaps complainants that were multiple complainants um, and whether that, that's something that you've seen in, in some of the complaints, whether they were admissible, admissible or inadmissible. Um, convener, there, there have been a small number of multiple uh, complainer, uh, complainants, um, very few in relation to MSPs. Mm -hmm. um, there's one particular part of the country where there is somebody with a great interest in making complaints <laughs> about councillors, but um, it's not a big issue with MSP complaints. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, 
Okay, uh, well, thank you. That's, I think, reasonably well covered that issue. Can we move on to public appointments, please? Um, I think Mr Bruce might have a thing or two to contribute here as well. Um, and I know that uh, Maureen Watt has some questions that she'd like to ask on this. Thank you, convener. Morning, gentlemen. Um, before I start, I think, uh, for the record, I'd like to mention that I was an independent assessor of public appointments uh, prior to coming into Parliament in 2006, a job I, I really enjoyed. Um, so, the uh, number of active appointment rounds completed um, in the past year has risen sharply uh, uh, compared to, to previous years. Given that there should be fewer public bodies around, why has there been that increase? Is it failure to appoint or, or, or people not serving their full terms? Or can you give a bit of an explanation as to why that is? Convener, um, th there's multiple reasons or factors. Um, the number of regulated public bodies changes. Um, I think three new ones were created certainly within the last year, not necessarily the year reported, um, but also some have been either abolished or removed from our remit. So the, n the number varies. Um, another factor uh, is that governments occasionally contemplate changing the landscape of public bodies, um, and that doesn't always follow through. So if they're contemplating changes, uh, they may hold back um, on making um, new appointments, um, and it may be that if, if it doesn't go ahead, then there ends up being a little bit of a backlog in effect. Um, some appointment rounds occur unexpectedly because people leave or become unwell. Um, and there have been quite a number of these. But the other factor, and I think probably the biggest one in the year that we've reported on, is that um, we've had discussions with um, government staff about how best to improve the process. And one of the big factors from our point of view is being involved early, being consulted early at an early stage in the appointment process, which allows us to have more influence in terms of what might be appropriate in terms of uh, attracting a more diverse field. Um, and so there are at least 12 in the figures reported where we were involved early on but the round then didn't go ahead for whatever reason. And there's nothing sinister in that, um, and it's actually something I welcome. Maureen? OK. Um, constraints on resources available to ministers to advise, well, to advise and support them, um, were identified uh, by you as a risk um, for the 2017-18 period. In the event, did resource complaints constraints have an impact on what you were able to achieve in that period? Um, I think they did have an impact. Um, you will see from the tables um, that although there's been a small increase in the percentage of women on boards, so it's up by 0.5 of a percent uh, in the course of the year, um, and a very small, another small increase in the numbers of people under the age of 50 appointed. These are two of the target groups, as it were. Um, the progress has been in the wrong direction in relation to other categories of applicants, um, particularly those who are disabled. Um, and I think that's because the... For, <clears throat> I don't think the government has been able to uh, you know, at official level, um, apply sufficient uh, coordination to the range of different factors which are involved in attracting successfully uh, more diverse people to boards. It's not a simple exercise. Um, it does require coordination at quite a high level of a number of different types of effort. And it has been a perennial problem, it's not something that's just arisen. I mean, I'm sure I had a, heard a few days ago um, a, t uh, a radio interview about this particular thing and um, Scotland was actually doing better than the other 
nations in terms of, of diversity, but it still wasn't um, good enough. Um, so you have identified um, Scottish Government restructuring as a potential risk to public appointments activity in the coming period. Can you elaborate on why you see this? Yes, it may sound simplistic, um, but it's not. Um, there was, and I've mentioned this in the report uh, and elsewhere, uh, there was a public boards and corporate diversity program. Sorry about the title. Um, but it was um, a program which I think, amongst other things, was a significant contributor to um, progress made in increasing diversity on public boards. Um, the main factor was probably the First Minister's um, profile on gender uh, balance, um, you know, which I think had a very big effect. But this programme did bring together um, quite different aspects of, if you like, government effort. Um, and I think in the, probably the year or two before the one that I've reported on just now, um, there was really quite a lot of progress in a systemic way. Um, and it's fair to say that actually the proportion of disabled people in, on boards in Scotland is higher than it is in uh, other parts of the UK, but it's, it could be better, it should be better. Um, and part of my statutory responsibility and that of my successor is to ensure, um, so far as reasonably practicable, uh, equality of opportunity. And I think that means um, making it, <coughs> making, changing the process in such a way that it is more attractive to and easier for people from other groups uh, to put themselves forward and, and to succeed in, in appointments. Um, and I think the loss of that coordinating <coughs> programme, which hasn't been replaced by anything effective uh, in the last couple of years, um, is one of the contributors to the progress not being such as it ought to be, I think. Can I, other Can I sorry, convener, I should say I, I, I have very recently had discussions with um, the, the relevant Director General uh, and I understand that reporting to uh, the Civil Service People Board um, is what will replace it. But there's been a gap of a couple of years when nothing effective has been there. Do you think we're relying on government too much to do this and it should be more the boards themselves and their local communities who um, you know, make, it, make a point of, of advertising the fact that you know, they want um, a broad range of people on, on their boards. And you know, there's always this thing about women don't think they can do things, and, and perhaps the same is true of um, ethnic minorities and folk with disabilities. So what can we do at a local level to encourage more people to come forward? Um, I think in terms of the detail, I'll, I'll ask Ian uh, to come in, but um, just very briefly, there are some very good examples where boards themselves have, as it were, taken the initiative, and because we've got the early engagement public appointments advisors uh, in the process, they've been able to assist, along with government staff, uh, in making that more effective. There's some really good examples of that. Um, I don't know, Ian might be able to give you some. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a very astute question, um, unsurprisingly, given <laughs> your background. Um, but it is one of the points that we've made to government. Um, I mean, clearly, the government isn't capable of changing the profile of all boards in Scotland. Uh, we've done great working together uh, in terms of nearing the gender diversity target. But these other groups, they, they are a bit harder to get on board. Um, uh, and it is more difficult. I'm not saying it's an intractable problem. Um, it is something that we are working with the government on. Um, and when it works, it works really well. Uh, and it genuinely is about everyone taking responsibility for what they can take responsibility for. Um, so just to use a very simple example, we've been very clear that, and we've seen a lot of changes in this area, um, when application packs are being put together, um, people generally speaking, aren't attracted by the Scottish Government brand. No disrespect to the Scottish Government, but you know they have a genuine interest in the work of that public body. That's, that's potentially why they, they might want to be a board member. 
So if the board itself um, engages with the public, uh, and that can be through social media and other means, it's engaging with its um, communities, its stakeholders, uh, and all the branding around the appointment exercise um, is clearly um, belonging to that public body, then people are going to be much more attracted to apply. Um, a recent example, and I think it's still live, would be for the Scottish Housing Regulator. Uh, and they're doing fantastic work. It's, it's a really, really accessible pack. They're running open days because they are very keen to have new members who have first-hand experiences, tenants of registered social landlords. And those are the groups that they are targeting. It all makes complete sense, and, and we certainly anticipate that being successful. And we've seen success where boards um, do engage in that way, certainly. Can I come back in on this? Of course. Yes. Um, it, this is dependent on the board having a clear idea of what they're looking for, and that, that's done effectively through succession planning, um, on which the government have issued fairly recently um, excellent guidance. Uh, and I know that the government are trying to uh, introduce what they're calling smarter sponsorship by the, the sponsor department, which should help to encourage uh, boards to engage in succession planning of this nature. But of course, succession planning involves thinking about it sufficiently far in advance. Um, and I do appreciate that in some cases the, the appointments occur unexpectedly. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Maureen. And Tom Mason, do you want to follow up? Yes, I just wondered in, in, this, in this debate in terms of um, ethnic minorities and disabled people on boards and things, we, some of the problem is defining disablement in, 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 in the wrong terms. Um, who is disabled? We're all disabled to some extent, in, in as much as we're, we're all different. Um, I, I just, it's, it's, you know, certain categories are included in certain categories and certain categories are just not. And I've, it's always been a bit of a muddle to me as to how it all works. I just wondered if there was any thoughts you had on that. Um, to be slightly controversial, I actually think difference is a benefit rather than a, um, something that you would class as a disability. But I agree with the point of your question. It's maybe something Ian could explain in greater detail. There, there are issues about what data is collected and how it's used um, and trying to apply a one-size-fits-all solution, uh, which won't work. But um, So all of the targets in the... Um in the annual report, the tables in the annual report, uh, ultimately were drawn from diversity delivers. But they, they do, to an extent, lump people together into groups. Uh, and that's why, uh, as I said, it's not an intractable problem, but it is a bit harder when it comes to things like BME uh, and things like disability. So some of the recommendations we have made are about disaggregating that 20%, for example, for disability, so that we have a clear picture and the government has a clear picture um, about where people are falling out and, and what that might be attributable, uh, attributable to. Um, there's a big difference between someone with uh, a visual impairment and someone with mobility problems and the ways in which a board needs to adapt to accommodate members depending on the disability that they may have clearly varies quite a lot as well. And I think unless the analysis is done, it's going to be far harder to redress under-representation in those areas. That's, that's why the research in the annual report, last two annual reports, has been recommended to help us to understand what the issues are at that granular level. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, um, Elaine Smith, would you like to go more on the gender uh, aspect? Well, I actually think, Convener, that what I was going to ask about gender representation in public boards and also under-representation, I think, <laughs> really, it's, it's mainly been addressed in answers to other questions, but could I just ask um, on the, the under-representation on, on the strands that you identify, do you include religion in that at all? Are the questions asked about religion and representation? Because when I look at the report, I don't really see it mentioned. I just wondered. Well, yes, we do. So the, the monitoring form is very extensive um, and it covers all sorts of things, including religion. We don't report on everything that we monitor, um, but certainly anything that the committee had a particular interest in, I'm sure we'd be happy to provide the figures. We do get them from the Scottish Government and we do review them. Um, the last time I reviewed them, I, I didn't see any differential in terms of how people were being progressing through the appointment process based on religion. Um, 
but I'd be happy to look those out for you if you felt that was of interest. Yeah, I think that would be if I could mm -hmm, perhaps follow that up separately. It was just when I was reading in the report all the, the, the different strands, religion wasn't there, so I did wonder. Under um, sexual orientation on the strands, you you say that um, assess why such applicants for chair positions fare more poorly than those who declare that they are heterosexual at shortlisting stage and at interview and address any barriers identified. Um, that, that was known heterosexual applicants. Do you do you have any more information on that? Why? We've asked the government to research it. Okay. And in the absence of that research, it's it's mm -hmm. just it's not possible to to provide an answer. I'd, I'd certainly like to. So that's something that the committee might want to pick up in By the future. By all means, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's very useful. Thank you very much, Elaine. <clears throat> and thanks, Ian, for that. Um, appointment rounds. I think Mark's got something he would like to ask. Mark Ruskell, please. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, good morning, morning to you. Um, I think you've already covered some elements of succession um, planning um, and, and the good practice around that. But I wanted just to sort of dive a little bit deeper into that because um, you do make comments in the um, thematic review um, about the, the importance of individual board member appraisals. And although the picture looks pretty good around that, you do highlight some examples, I think, for boards where that sort of appraisal process is not perhaps being implemented in the best way it, it could be. And I just wonder if there are, if there are lessons, lessons or good practices there um, to draw on. Um, I mean, there has been, for example, you know, quite a lot of public concern about the board of NHS Tayside and some of the comings and goings throughout that board. And I'm, I'm just wondering kind of whether there's an issue there for some of these boards in terms of the, the depth of work that's being done in terms of appraisal and, and how that feeds into succession planning. Yes. Um, so I don't think the review demonstrated that there was an issue there, to be honest. So it was a very small proportion of all the reappointments we looked at. And, and from our perspective, um, it was very much an improving picture. And we saw very clear and very good evidence that appraisal was going on. Um, to supplement that, uh, I have seen um, there's a new NHS blueprint for governance. So, you know, I mean, clearly it's a live issue for the NHS in Scotland. Um, and, and one of the recommendations in there is about um, improving on what they currently do in terms of practice. I understand they're going to set up a steering group to, to draw in the best practice from around Scotland. Um, and that's with a view to improving on a number of areas, including succession planning, but also the way in which people, individuals are appraised. But over and above that, uh, and it was very heartening to see, clearly there, there ought to be a thread running through individual appraisals to board appraisals, mm -hmm. and the extent to which you bring in people from outside to have a look and, and see the extent to which that is operating effectively as well. So, mm -hmm. so I am aware that the government is doing work in that area, but from our review, it, it's certainly an improving picture based on what we saw previously. Okay, okay, thanks for that. And, um, you know, the, we've had a discussion already about improving diversity in terms of background and, and experiences of those um, coming onto boards, you know, beyond the, the protected characteristics. Um, can I ask you, you mentioned that there's been a, a slight increase in under 50s uh, coming onto boards. Um, and I'm just wondering to what extent your work involves engaging with young people to really ad identify what the barriers might be and, and how, how that direct lived experience of young people, for example, um, is kind of brought into that thinking around good practice. Do you ask young people basically about why they're not going onto boards? Um, short answer is we don't do that. Mm. Um, I know the government have a, a sort of a pilot scheme at the moment um, with one particular major employer um, to try and uh, encourage younger staff to be interested and to be released uh, to undertake work on public boards. Um, we do get involved in outreach, um, but not to younger people specifically, um, I think it's fair to say. Um, and we don't do it on our own uh, mm -hmm. because um, 
Well, that's not the role, frankly. Um, what we do is try and support the government with um, exercises that, that they're undertaking. Um, I mean, younger, under 50 is quite a broad categorisation for younger people. Some of us uh, are struggling to remember maybe un, un, it. But, uh, maybe uh, under 30 uh, would be more of an issue. <laughs> How many people under 30 do but, we have on public boards? There are obviously particular issues. Um, I, I think it's a an area where it should be possible to make progress. Um, one of the challenges is making uh, the work on boards attractive in itself. And what has come out of the thematic review is that people in that younger age group uh, are particularly attracted by the opportunities for personal development. That's something we've flagged up in our report, uh, personal and professional development. Um, another issue is whether um, a rather old-fashioned approach to assessment is taken, which depends on what position you've held and how long you've held it, mm -hmm. as opposed to what is your experience, um, which may not actually be mm -hmm. in a, a working environment anyway, but mm -hmm. it could be perfectly mm -hmm. valid. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there are all these aspects that, um, if they're brought together, um, will achieve progress. And as I say, there has been an increase in the number of under-50s appointed, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good sign. So in the right direction. It may be worth saying, so we have done some outreach with the University of West of Scotland, which we are hoping to expand, uh, and with all of the colleges. Um, so, And that's been attached to the diversity research as well. Mm -hmm. So um, so we're certainly trying to encourage people from a broader spectrum, and also their stakeholders. So although primarily um, for the University of West of Scotland, we were talking to academics, because that's something that potentially they might aspire to, but equally... You know, you have a, a, a whole range of students, different backgrounds there, mm. and we're encouraging the academics who work with them to encourage, in turn, their students to have a think about a role in public life mm -hmm. at some point in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, just Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, Mark. Gil uh, Patterson. Very apt. Uh, to have to declare an interest. Please don't forget anybody over 65. <laughs> That's a serious question. <laughs> There, there is no bar to the appointment of people over the age of 65. Like There's a chance of forgetting anybody when it's girls, it's unlikely, but then you go. Um, OK, thanks very much for that, Gil. Um, Mark, have you got something further? Yeah, come here. Just, a, just a final question. It's about the public appointments that require parliamentary approval. Um, and obviously, that requires a, you know, an additional sort of process in here. I've you know, been part of that in relation to the appointment of the Scottish Land Commission. Um, it's just whether um, you, you think that acts as a barrier uh, to the diversity of ap applications, or uh, I mean, there might be some people that quite enjoy the opportunity to come in and and and, and make their case in front of a, a, a committee, but it perhaps also might be a, a barrier as well to some. Um, I think it's probably too early to say on the basis of experience in this parliament um, well, I, we don't have evidence of it being a barrier here. Um, there is research conducted um, uh, in, at Westminster um, which produced evidence of a comparable or remote, fairly comparable process it's not identical, but um, being a discouraging factor. Um, and whilst I agree that there will be people who would love to have a chance to say something to a committee, the, the process has to be related to and restricted to the criteria for appointment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there will be more people who would be slightly daunted by the prospect of having to justify themselves in front of a parliamentary committee, mm -hmm. um, even one as um, polite as this one. Um, the evidence at Westminster was that although the process started off um, being quite constrained and contained, um, committees, as time went on, uh, became more relaxed about the sorts of issues they would ask about and ask about are more political, mm -hmm. um, which is clearly going to inhibit people who are not so minded from mm -hmm. applying. And I think the other thing to remember <coughs> is 
given that we're talking about diversity and attracting people from groups in society, and I appreciate uh, Mr Arthur's point that they're not homogeneous groups, but attracting people from groups which don't identify with, first of all, the process of government and secondly, with public bodies, um, it's going to be particularly difficult to encourage people from those um, smaller or more marginal groups mm -hmm. to put themselves in front of a, a parliamentary committee as, as part of the process. Mm -hmm. I would suggest. Do, do, do you see uh, any good practice there? I mean, I, I referred earlier to the appointment of the um, Scottish Land Commission. Um, do you feel that there was good practice in the way that the committee and this parliament went about that? Or So far, um, with the bodies to which this has applied, um, the process has been able to run, I think, within the bounds of the code of practice for... Um, ministerial appointments but there are real risks with it um, and it is possible that um, a committee might take a different approach um, and for example the big concern I have is not restrict itself to the criteria which have been advertised at the beginning merit is the key principle in terms of appointment and if questions are asked about something which has not been part of the definition of merit and somebody fails on that basis, um, they then have legitimate grounds for complaint about the unfairness of the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, and we're also trying to avoid bluntly political cronyism, people being appointed or not looked at because they are right or wrong in terms of the, the people they know. So th you know, these risks are increased. Um, the process takes longer as well, which is another factor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not a particularly attractive factor. Mm -hmm. And the final thing, sorry, um, on this, what if the committee decides they don't like the applicant on grounds which are not specified in the criteria for appointment? What, what does the minister do then? Mm -hmm. well, I suppose, what, what do you do then? <laughs> Um, I don't do anything, I monitor the process, mm. but if a complaint comes in, mm. um, I will have to deal with it on the basis of the, the criteria set out in the, mm -hmm. um, the advertisement for the post and so the code be, of practice. Yeah, so you'd be reliant on a complaint coming to you before you could... I, it's not for me to go mm. looking for trouble. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you, uh, Commissioner, for that. Um, can we touch, please won't take us too long, hopefully, um, on the financial position of the Commissioner's Office. Um, and I know that Gil Parsons is interested in that. Thanks, Marm, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we see there was a significant uh, decrease in uh, expenditure between 2016-17 and 2017-18. Uh, and I note that uh, you're underspent. It looks like good news in many ways for the public purse. So I wonder if there's any a background to that, why there would be a decrease. Um, Convener, uh, I, I will explain it. I, th I think the detail is set out on pages 41 and 42 of the report. Um, there was a major reduction in staff costs um, and about half of that, um, about £60,000 of that, was attributable to the introduction of the new process for the initial assessment of complaints about councillors and members of public bodies. Um, we, I don't know why we didn't do it before, frankly, um, but we now do it in, in the office rather. We used to send that out to investigators who are employed part-time, um, and it took more investigators' time to do it that way than it does the way we now do it in the office. Um, that was one factor. The number of complaints against councillors and public members of public bodies, which is the biggest part of our complaints work, reduced by about 25% in that year. It was the year after an election. People make fewer complaints, uh, it would appear, um, in the year after an election, certainly councillors and public bodies. Um, we also had a number of staff changes, um, which meant, first of all, there are little gaps um, between paying for somebody and them going and somebody else coming in. And secondly, the person who's appointed to replace tends to be a, a lower point on the salary scale. So between all of these things, um, we save quite a lot of money. Thanks, 
for that. Is that okay, Gil? Yeah, that's fine. Can I, can I move on to the lobbying? Uh, and yes, I know well, I am um, your future work in terms of, thank you very much for the covering the financial side. Um, could we have a wee uh, think about the future work and um, Gil Patterson also has a question on that, please. There's a couple of questions. Um, I know that uh, because of the Lobbying Act and that just came into force early this year and it's just been passed on to your remit, and I just wondered about because of the commencement of the Lobbying Act, uh, what impact has that had on you and do you, do you anticipate uh, more uh, cases in regards to that? Um, convener, short answer it has, is that it has not yet had any impact by way of uh, complaints which I've had to deal with. Um, that's partly due, I think, to um, there being a six-month period before anything could really have, have gone wrong in that sense, um, in terms of the way the Act's structured. Um, I know that the general approach within the Parliament when this legislation was going through was to try and take a light touch, um, even though the actual process setting in, set in the Act is a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Um, it's quite a clunky process. Um, it's modelled on the process for dealing with MSP complaints, um, which is quite clunky. Um, no complaints have come in. I've pleased to say I had very good relations with the registrar and, and, and with the lobbying registrar's team. So I'm aware of what is going on behind the scenes. Um, I'm hoping that there won't be a flood of complaints. Uh, I have no reason to suppose that there will be. Um, but it is possible there's a very large number of people registered, uh, lobbyists registered, um, and things could be missed. Um, I think if they're missed by mistake, then they will be rectified. Um, if they were missed deliberately, then it would be more difficult to ignore. Um, and as it goes on, there are bound to be complaints, but I can't say how many. I Thanks for that. I, I, I hear you saying uh, the system looks a bit clunky. Would you think that uh, maybe this committee? Well, first, the, the, well, if there is, if it is clunky, is that a reason for maybe people not uh, utilising the system to make the complaint? And if it is clunky, should someone be looking at it to kind of refine that a bit better? Um, convener, I don't think it would inhibit anybody making a complaint. Right. Um, but the handling of it, I do think, is clunky. I, I've said this before, it's not a, a new point. Um, and if this committee or anybody else were prepared to have a look at it, I would be delighted. Mm. So I think it okay. could be improved. I know that there is to be a review of the operation of the Act anyway, and it's possibly something that can be um, dealt with as, as part of that review. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, is you yeah. still on lobbying at the moment? You know, I was just going to go into the next I question. was just going to say, well, um, the Lobbying Act element, thanks very much. The Lobbying Act element, I think, is extremely um, important to a lot of us because we've obviously, we could be targets of being lobbied. Um, so that's extremely useful um, and maybe something that might come back to at a later stage. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> as far as, <clears throat> I'm going to let Gil Parson speak because my voice has just gone naturally. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm struggling just to make make head. I've got a terrible cold. That's a man's cold, you know. No, no, no like men are, but hopeless. I, a very similar question, and it's because of events happening and your involvement <clears throat> uh, in it. And it comes to, when it comes to sexual harassment, and I think the profile it seems to be almost a worldwide phenomena that the profile of uh, sexual harassment and other uh, harassments against women indeed are, have really reached a crescendo. Uh, but I know that you've only had one case in that regard in terms of uh, sexual harassment. Are you anticipating uh, uh, an upward uh, uh, number of complaints? And if so, are you preparing for it? Um, I have no better knowledge than anybody else in this room about whether there will be more complaints. Um, I think we are prepared already for handling complaints um, if they do come in. I think that the biggest challenge, actually, is going to be 
reaching agreement on an appropriate procedure um, for the handling of complaints. Um, as you're aware, that is quite a controversial issue at the moment. Um, I'm not directly involved. Um, I'm aware that this committee will, at some point in the reasonably near future, receive uh, the report of the joint working party in this parliament. Um, and I'm guessing that that will require this committee to take views on aspects of the procedure. For example, um, is there to be a time limit of one year um, for the submission of the complaint at the moment with MSP complaints mm -hmm. if it relates to conduct which is alleged to have occurred more than 12 months before the person making the complaint could have been aware of it. Um, I can't investigate without referring it first to this committee for a view or a direction. Um, I am, I've read very carefully the report by Dame Laura Cox into uh, issues at Westminster. Um, she argues quite cogently that there should not be uh, such a restriction uh, in terms of timing on the submission of complaints. Now, that is something for, for you and others uh, in the Parliament uh, to take a view on. Um, but that may well have a knock-on impact on other complaints as well. Um, there are quite difficult issues as well about who gets to comment at what stage on the uh, reports which are being submitted. Um, under the Act which covers MSP complaints, and, and this would apply at the moment if um, a sexual harassment complaint were to come in um, in relation to the conduct of an MSP, um, I have to allow any witness to comment on the summary or the statement of their evidence which goes in the report. And I have to allow the person against whom the complaint has been made to comment on the report before it is submitted to you. I'm not required to pass the report to the person who made the complaint. Now, under the Laura Cox um, recommendations, um, that, that wouldn't be acceptable. And if you are minded to go down the road of saying, well, both the person who complained and the person who's complained about should have an opportunity to comment, there's a question about the stage at which that is allowed to happen. Um, for what it's worth, I haven't seen what's coming forward, my preference would be that that should be at the stage of findings and fact. If it's at a later stage, when I have then, or whoever's in my position, added conclusions, um, you then end up with a curious position where you might have three or more sets of views on the findings in fact, which I or my successor will have assimilated and taken a view on and then drawn conclusions, and then you might have at least three views on the conclusions. So you, you'll be faced with quite a lot of comments and observations on the comments, and I think probably an almost unworkable um, position. So I'm, I'm making a plea in advance. Uh, if there are to be opportunities to comment on the investigation before it comes to you, and I can see the force of that argument, that it should be at the point where findings in fact are being set. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> we do have uh, the joint working group, the Scottish Parliament joint working group coming uh, to um, give evidence to us in, uh, at our next meeting on the 20th of December, um, which we will raise those elements which you have uh, pointed, which could be useful to yourself, actually, uh, feeding back you know, to us then if there are such complaints coming through. Um, I don't know if there are any. Oh, sorry, Gil, were you still? Yeah, not, not in specific. There's just one on procedures, and it's the first point that you made in, re in reaction to my question, and that's the point of a uh, time, time bar. It's quite a feature in Scots law in general. But do you think there should be a, some change to that, in, not specifically on sexual harassment? I'm talking about across the board, 
where the seriousness of the an investigation that has been found to, to or, or upheld a complaint upheld that there should be an architectural uh, um, uh, form a differential between uh, certain types of complaints or or do you think you know uh, there should be in serious def definitions of seriousness uh, that there should be a, a, a longer time convener it's a very fair question it's it's quite a difficult issue um, in part because of the problem of definition um, we can talk quite easily about serious complaints but we, we could have endless arguments about whether something is sufficiently serious to be treated one way and differently from another which is less serious that's a real issue um, and I think it would be a problem for either this committee or the Commissioner, if it was the Commissioner's responsibility, to draw that distinction. I think you'd, you would probably never be finished with challenges to the decisions that are made. Um, and I and, and, uh, I do have a legal training. I think if it's good enough for one category of complaint, why shouldn't it be good enough for another category of complaint? Um, I, so I I think you may receive arguments, or arguments may be made, that sexual harassment is a category on its own. And I'm not diminishing the importance or seriousness of it. Um, far from it. I'm quite the opposite, really. But I, you know, th there are other serious issues which might be the subject of a complaint. And I don't see why the rules for the two different types should be different, because what we're talking about is natural justice um, and being fair to the person complaining and the person against whom the complaint is made. Um, and that's one of the other things that you will probably find yourselves wrestling with um, is whether the process is an investigation or whether it is um, an adversarial process. Now, some of the arguments that I have read in the press as being made in the House of Lords recently confuse the two. And what you have at the moment is an investigatory process conducted by me or whoever succeeds me, um, then reporting into you. Um, you don't have a properly adversarial process, unlike the Standards Commission, which does when it deals with complaints about councillors. And the rules of engagement, as it were, are different according to whether you've got an investigation or an adversarial process or some sort of amalgam of the two, which is what we have here. These are quite difficult issues that are going to have to be addressed. Well, I don't know if he's going to address it, but Jamie Halker Johnson has a quick uh, word with you as well, please. So, it was just actually in, in terms of your key risks for office for 2018-19, the one I was interested in was the that the um, systems suffer a significant cyber attack, given the nature of some of the things we've been talking about today. Um, how confident can you be, or how confident are you, that the systems will be in place, or the protections will be in place, that the information that can be very sensitive will be protect protected? We are doing everything we can. Um, we have already achieved the, the government's um, cyber essentials uh, accreditation for the security of our system. Um, and we are trying to achieve what's called cyber essentials plus accreditation. Um, we've been trying for weeks. And <laughs> ironically, the external body who are assessing our cyber security apparently can't get into our system to test it, <laughs> which I find quite a relief. Are you suggesting that's sense. a good sign? I think so. <laughs> um, um, I'm not complacent about that at all. We're very well aware of the issue, and we're doing everything we can to make sure we're as well prepared as we can be. OK, thank you. Sir. OK, Jim. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much. I think um, you, you uh, stood up to the rigours of our questioning extremely well, both of you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ian Bruce for coming along um, very much for uh, the, uh, the in-depth uh, discussion that you, you allowed us to have with you. Um, I'd particularly like to thank uh, Bill Thompson as the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, as this may well be the last time uh, that you appear in front of this committee. Uh, Bill, thank you. And uh, 
we'd like um, as a committee to thank you for all the work that you've done during your period as the Commissioner and wish you all the very best for the future. And whatever you do, you're always welcome back here anyway. So thank you. That's very kind. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, then. I think we'll just suspend for a second or two just to, so you don't have to charge out the door. So you're OK. Just take your time. You're all right. <laughs> which is in private, but <clears throat> for the moment, um, agenda item three on cross-party groups uh, to consider an annual update on the cross-party group's compliance with the Code of Conduct. Uh, there are 106 uh, cross-party group <clears throat> uh, groups at the moment, and members will see from the report that compliance with the Code is very high. So are there any comments from members, please? Yes, Jolene. Thanks, Convener. No, I, I think it's good that the compliance is <coughs> high. Um, I just wondered if, um, where we didn't get an explanation, would it be worth asking for an explanation for some of the the groups where perhaps they haven't submitted their annual return in time, for example? Yes. I think that's a very good. <coughs> it's a very good point, actually. I think that um, we, you know, we have an annual monitoring report, and uh, therefore. We want to make sure that we take the, the monitoring seriously. And if there are 106 groups, there's a lot. And if there are some which may not be meeting what we can see as the compliance standards, then we should uh, potentially take that forward. Will we bring that back again for a future meeting when we get a chance to actually uh, look further in depth to that? Or would, is there any, anything in particular at the moment that you've um, pulled up on? Nothing. No, I just think that there's often explanations and, and those are given, but where an explanation isn't given, I, I feel as if we should 
we should ask for yeah. it. Because most of them do give explanations and those explanations are perfectly reasonable yeah. and understandable. But where there isn't an explanation, I, I think the onus would be honest to, to yeah. just ask for one. Well, as, as we know, our, um, our uh, clerking team are very, very strong on ensuring that people do comply with the code um, and do basically chase people up if, the, um, if there are issues. Um, but if there are any potential issues, um, and there have been, uh, as far as we know, three um, groups which have basically folded um, in, in previous times, in, in recent times, um, but for, for, obvious, for decent reasons, um, I think that uh, we are very much... Um, our clerks are very much on top of the issues, um, but that we could bring this back if there are, uh, if there are any specifics that w maybe are not potentially being covered as we believe it just now, in terms of people's response um, and in terms of why they may be they may not actually be meeting uh, with the code, um, we could bring that back, but. Uh, can we take note of that at the moment then, Elaine, and we can have a look? Yep. Yeah, I think we should also just thank the clerks for the work they do, yeah. trying to um, make sure that um, members, your conveners, etc., do comply, because it's often difficult in busy timescales. And as I said, there are often good and understandable reasons. But I think we should just put it on the record that the clerks yeah. do a good job in trying to alert groups and make sure that they do comply. Um, and yes, I'm... I'm would be happy to note the report just now. Yeah, well, I th I thank you very much, and I think that's that's um, something that we would all actually go along with. This the the efforts of the Clark and team, which are pretty much successful as far as I can make out. Um, but that we can have a, a wee look at it anyway on our own basis and see if there's anything that we would like to raise. Uh, however, we will note that. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Any other points? No. Yeah. Oh, Maureen, please. Thank you. Yeah. 10 days calendar notice of meetings to clerks. Um, I can see that it might be an oversight to not inform the clerks, but I get, just get the impression from my inbox that um, the notification to MSPs is not often 10 days either. So mm -hmm. I think something needs to be done mm -hmm. um, about that, maybe just a bit more. Uh, well, just people need to be aware that you know, just saying tomorrow there's a meeting, tomorrow night there's a meeting of Aye. the <laughs> such and such a cross party yeah. group is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, and also, those who seem to think that it's okay to always have the group meet on a Thursday night is not acceptable to me anyway either, that there should not always be on a Thursday night, um, that it needs to be sort of at different times. Mm -hmm. Well, we could certainly notify groups, um, I believe, uh, to sort of put forward those points, because I think the points are, are well taken. Um, we can notify groups um, about their responsibilities to ensure that their uh, MSP members are taken into consideration and not taken for granted, I suppose, if I can put it that way, um, when when meetings are being, um, are being established. Um, We'll take that forward. I think that's very useful. Thank you very much. I don't. I think most groups are aware that um, MSP members uh, do have a lot of other issues and items that they've got to cover as well, including other cross-party groups that they're members of. Uh, but it does no harm at all just to make everyone aware that you know they have responsibilities to ensure that the cross-party groups um, meet with their with their uh, meet with their duties and also meet with their MSPs because we don't want to make it difficult for MSPs, in particular those from distances away, to actually have to meet with them. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah Tom. Just ask, is, is there a sort of one-sheet guide as to what they should be doing? That, yes, it's in the Code of Conduct. Is, um, it, is, it, readily, I mean, is it readily identifiable? And um, well, I think that um, we'll... I, I personally don't know that, uh, but what we will do is that we'll bring back um, a well. We we'll maybe let people see what the code of conduct actually says, because I'm guilty as anybody of not looking at it myself. Actually, yeah. you know, um, so that we can we can actually be aware that uh, yeah. what's in it, and then 
maybe we could have a look at what's not being met by the cross-party groups mm -hmm. in our experience as MSPs, mm -hmm. in which case we could actually maybe yeah. contribute a wee bit there to help yeah. with their with their meeting their duties. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think, well, that was faster than we even expected, so that was very good. It was very worthwhile doing, though, because and I would like to thank the, the clerking team again for the uh, annual monitoring report, which is a lot of work. Um, but we've got it there, and we can take those items forward. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, so that's us now um, moving into private session, please. So I can ask the public to leave. Thank you very much.